Well, cool. Okay, so um, thank you all for coming. What a joy in your Thai house for you watching the so I will start off by um, just explaining briefly um, what is Ethereum. Um, so um, how many people here have an, at least kind of know what a blockchain is? Excellent. Okay, that makes it useful. Um, that makes it uh, much easier because I don't have to understand what a blockchain is and hopefully everyone can recognize one. So Ethereum is a, uh, the basic idea behind Ethereum is that it is a, a general purpose blockchain. Um, so one of the, um, so one of the analogies that I often use to uh, describe what Ethereum does is that you can think of uh, blockchains that existed before Ethereum as being either like pocket calculators or like Swiss Army knives. So if you look at blockchains that existed <coughs> maybe five years ago, seven years ago, things like originally Bitcoin, then Namecoin, then some of the earlier projects, they all tend to be designed around doing one particular function. So kind of like a pocket calculator, it can add numbers, it can divide, divide numbers, it can multiply numbers, and it can do those things well but it's limited. There aren't any other things that you can do inside of it. Other some of the blockchains that people have been building more recently are Swiss Army Knife blockchains. So they're blockchains that where the designers realize that you can use blockchains for many different functions, and so that they're not just for currencies, they're not just for transferring money, but they have many other applications. So today I'll talk about financial applications, smart contracts, identity management, and DAOs. So many blockchain developers realize that there are many different things that you, that you can do on a blockchain. And so they would create blockchains where these blockchains have many different transaction types, many different features, where the blockchain protocol understands many different types of applications. So with Ethereum, we decided to take a different and even more general purpose track. So what we said with Ethereum is, we know that there is a large number of applications, a large number of things that people might want to do with blockchains. And so instead of making a blockchain designed for one application, or even making a blockchain designed for 20 applications, we are going to make a blockchain where that blockchain contains a built-in programming language. So kind of like the operating system on your computer or on your phone has a general purpose programming language. And we will allow people to write whatever applications they want, whether it's currencies, whether it's domain name systems, whether it's voting systems, registries, in this programming language, upload their programs onto the blockchain, and then the blockchain can run these programs. So kind of like a blockchain-based decentralized operating system. So this is the original idea behind Ethereum. Um, one of the um, other kind of interesting uh, concepts and things that you can do on top of Ethereum is this idea of uh, smart contracts. So the idea behind a uh, smart contract, in very simple terms, is that it is a computer program, and it, in this case it's a computer program on the blockchain that controls digital assets. So the, uh, the idea of a smart contract was first um, invented about 20 years ago by someone named Nick Zabo. And the analogy that he made was this. He said, in the real world, we have things like vending machines. And what a vending machine is, is it's a physical device. It's a, it's a device in the real world that exists in order to enforce the <coughs> rules of a contract. And the rules of the contract are simple. You put money in, and water comes out. You know, drinks come out, Coca-Cola comes out. You do not put money in, water does not come out, right? So the rule is very simple, right? But the purpose of the vending machine is it's a device that exists in the physical world that's intended to essentially execute, enforce the rules of this agreement. And so the idea behind smart contracts, as he conceived them, 
is that you can take this concept and you can bring it into the digital world. So we can say we can, now in the, in the physical world, there are always limits to how much security you can have. If, if there is a vending machine, you can take a hammer and you can break it. In the, in the digital world, we can use cryptography and we can uh, computer security to make smart contracts that are much that are much more secure, much stronger, and much more powerful. So we can have computer programs where each where a computer program has rules that say, if this happens, then transfer some digital assets to, to some other address. If this happens, then transfer some other digital assets to some other address, and so on. <coughs> and so we can use computer programs like this in order to enforce terms of financial contracts, to enforce escrow agreements, to enforce any kind of contract that says, if this happens, then do that. And you can, if these smart contracts are on the blockchain, and if they are dealing with digital assets that are also on the blockchain, then you can, you can have a system that does this in a way that is much more secure and requires much less trust in any kind of intermediaries or any kind of third parties. So this is uh, the idea behind smart contracts. Um, so the um, Ethereum blockchain is, um, a, uh, it is a public blockchain, and it is a network that has um, now, been, uh, now been running for, t for about uh, two years. So in fact, I believe either today or tomorrow is the uh, second anniversary of the Ethereum blockchain. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> Um, so we have about 25,000 nodes in uh, various different places around the world. Um, most of them tends to be either in uh, North America or in Europe. And there is also some in Asia. And if you want to zoom into Asia a bit, then you can see that um, Shanghai has uh, quite a lot, Beijing has quite a few, Taiwan has a lot, and um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen are also you know, one of the major centers where there is quite a bit of Ethereum activity. Um, so, usage of uh, the Ethereum network has been increasing by uh, quite a bit over the last few months. So we can see here that the, uh, the number of transactions, the amount of usage um, of the Ethereum network has increased by about a factor of 10 over the last uh, six months or so. Exponential. Yes. Exponentially. Because of ICO. Um, because of a lot of things. I, mean, I, think, I think ICOs are one factor, but they're nowhere close to the only factor. Um, so the blockchain is actually now running at something like 40% of, uh, of its current capacity. And we'll talk about this later, because it does mean that the technology behind Ethereum and the technology behind blockchains still does need to continue to improve so that we can accommodate the needs of, uh, of a much larger user base. Um, so, what are people using Ethereum for? What's the point of Ethereum? What can you use it for? So, there's a lot of a, a different, because Ethereum is a, a general purpose blockchain, um, you can, it can be used for very many different kinds of applications. And we've seen people use, actually using Ethereum for many different kinds of applications. So about five years ago, you know, the, the only thing that people were using blockchains for is creating cryptocurrencies or creating digital assets, creating digital tokens. And you know, even though today we have many more applications, and I will talk about many of these applications after this, using a, digital assets continues to be one of the major uses of the Ethereum blockchain. So we can see here that here is just a yeah, block explorer, and this is showing recent Ethereum transactions. So you can see there's people are sending units of ADX, FUN, WINGS, EDG, EOS, FUN, status tokens. So there is some very, a, a lot of people who want to issue digital assets for various reasons. Some of them are ICOs, some of them are not ICOs, some of them are DAOs. There are many kinds of assets, and a lot of them are issuing on them on the Ethereum blockchain. So right now, in terms of blockchain-based kind of second-layer digital assets, Ethereum has, I believe, something like a 70% market share. Um, so other use cases. So the you know, Monetary Authority of Singapore is um, 
and looking at using a uh, per permissioned version of the Ethereum blockchain in order to, um, uh, this is still a very early stage test and it doesn't mean any, and it still doesn't mean anything in the long term. But they did this test on a version of Ethereum to look at, you know, what is it, what would it look like if the government were to issue its own, then its own digital currency on the blockchain. So there actually have been several projects like this. There was um, a similar one in, in the UK last year, and uh, there, are, there are projects that are happening in Russia as well. So there is quite a lot of government interest in using blockchains for uh, various applications. Um, so this is um, ENS, and I personally find ENS interesting because I find that this, aside from using blockchains for digital assets, I think that this is probably one of them. It's probably one of the simplest to understand and one of the easiest uh, and, and potentially most promising non-financial, non-currency related uh, blockchain applications. So, and uh, this is actually something that people have been trying to do on top of blockchains for about six years. So the basic idea is it's a registry where you can register names. So if for example, I want, you know, we have, I want to talk to you over some chat application over the internet, then we would, there would have to be some kind of name by which someone can refer to your account or refer to my account. Right? So if I, you know, if I want to talk to someone on WeChat and I want to add them, then I can scan their QR code or I can also type in their username or I can also type in their phone number. Right? And usernames, phone numbers, email addresses, these are all kind of identifiers that we use 